welcome, John. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to this week's webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available shortly after completion. My name is Joan Marston, I'm the coordinator of PalChase, and I will be moderating the session today. This webinar is number seven of a series in a project on palliative care and COVID-19 developed jointly by the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care, the International Children's Palliative Care Network, Palliative Care in Humanitarian Aid Situations and Emergencies, and the Worldwide Hospice Palliative Care Alliance. The objective of this series is to provide globally relevant information and guidance to civil society and UN organizations, to policymakers, administrators, and healthcare providers on palliative care in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. These webinars are accompanied by briefing notes written by experts from around the world. These briefing notes are available in the globalpalliativecare.org website, and the webinars are uploaded in the WHPCA website. We are extremely grateful to all the contributors to the series and especially to today's presenters for accepting our invitation to participate in this collaborative project. This webinar will feature four presentations and then there will be time at the end for questions and answers. Please submit your questions through the chat box. Just make sure that they're directed to everyone and Shirley Ennison and Kate Jackson from the WHPCA will be condensing and reading them to the speakers. And so we're going to begin with palliative care in humanitarian crises. And our first speaker is Dr. Moira Ling. Moira is the medical director of Cardis International Palliative Care Trust. And she's actively involved in exploring the needs, building capacity and ensuring advocacy for those affected by humanitarian emergencies, both acute and chronic. This has led to innovative work and partnerships in northern Uganda with South Sudanese re refugees and in Gaza and the West Bank with Palestinian colleagues. Moira is also a senior advisor at the Global Health Academy at the University of Edinburgh and advisor to the Palliative Care Unit of Makere University in Kampala. Moira, over to you. Thank you, Joan, and uh, to everyone who's organised the series of webinars, but this one in particular. It's just lovely to join with you. Um, it, you see I'm from the UK on my um, uh, little bio there, but actually I'm based in Uganda at the moment. So greetings from Uganda. And I'll be giving an overview of this situation. I'll be particularly sticking to the briefing note, so please download that and look at it and highlighting from it. Uh, perhaps if we could advance the slides to the first one, thank you. Um, and I'll also be pulling in direct experience, as Joan has mentioned, from uh, Gaza, from uh, northern Uganda, South Sudanese refugees, and actually also from work in India. I want to thank, next slide, thank you to the contributors to this briefing note. A, a really great group of people that I've had the privilege of working with, uh, chaired by Joan. Uh, their names are listed on the next slide. So thank you to all of their hard work and they represent expertise. Sorry, this one is the briefing note. So this is the briefing note that we're basing this uh, session on. Thank you so much. And then this is the list of contributors to that briefing note who bring a real breadth of um, experience, but also a lot of wisdom into this situation. Thank you so much. Next slide. So in the briefing note, we outline the issue. And that is that palliative care is not integrated into refugee and humanitarian crisis settings. And that that is obviously particularly pertinent now in the COVID-19 pandemic. But isn't it interesting that we're discussing um, issues of humanitarian crises in the middle of a global pandemic? You know, in some ways, the issues that we're talking about in this short session are actually the issues that we're discussing throughout these COVID-19 uh, webinar series. And some of the thinking around how we integrate palliative care started with issues like the Ebola pandemic. And you can see a picture there of a healthcare worker and a patient. And also mass 
uh, casualty events due to, nat to natural disasters, such as the Nepal earthquake. And again, this is a picture with the permission of Dan Mundy that shows a triaging process and how palliative care was identified during that time. Next slide. So given that we have this challenge, what are the issues going forward? And these are straight from our briefing note. We have issues of access to healthcare in general, and particularly to the measures which would allow infection control. I'm delighted that Megan is speaking next, and she's going to illustrate these from a particular setting, the Rohingya uh, refugee settlements. We have pre-existing illness. We have this challenge of palliative care not being part of the response already, as well as the response going forward for COVID-19. We don't have essential medicines and essential package. Think of that Nepal earthquake. There weren't even pain control medicines then. Now we're thinking maybe more of symptom control medications relevant for the COVID-19 pandemic, but for everybody living with chronic disease during this time. We're thinking about how to integrate into humanitarian response and we're remembering that this is a situation where there are multiple losses already and we're adding in more potential losses, particularly around some of these end of life care, very precious moments. Next slide. Next slide, thank you. There's quite a bit of information. Please look up these, look up these for more background. They're there in the references. And they are some of the documents that help us understand um, palliative care in humanitarian settings. Thank you so much. That includes a field manual. And I think those who might have the link for this, this field manual was written for humanitarian workers, but it does have some open access chapters, maybe that they can be shared in the chat. And there is this excellent sphere guideline, which is a kind of like handbook for humanitarian setting. And of course, our WHO guideline, which is fantastic. Thank you to the WHO for all of your support in this area. Next slide. So what does this look like in practice? Think of this young child in Yemen, a situation with one of the worst humanitarian uh, situations, particularly around food security and children. What's it going to be like to add COVID-19 into that? Or Syria, in the midst again of war, and then there's the impact in Syria, and then there's this migration that has come as people are trying to seek a place of safety and all the challenges of that journey and what happens when they arrive. Or maybe a more recent situation, Venezuela, already facing such food insecurity and challenge. And now Latin America, of course, is the newest epicenter for the COVID pandemic. Next slide. What is the reality? These, you may not be able to see all these figures, but today we have more displaced people than at any point in history. Many are displaced within their own countries and many are displaced to the nearby countries. So please remember it's the nearby countries who themselves may also be being affected by the same natural disaster or the same conflict. And we talk also about complex situations where you have existing uh, humanitarian settings and then you add something like COVID-19 into that. And Gaza, for example, is a good example of that and Yemen and Syria. And you can also see that the countries hosting displaced people often themselves are fragile or with health systems that are, that are fragile. Thank you. I also want to next slide. I want to thank you, thank the authors of this paper. Um, this has been a really helpful paper in the Lancet to show where palliative care fits into the COVID pandemic. And they've used the language of humanitarian settings and pandemics, tsunami of suffering. And this actually very neatly highlights what we've been saying in these uh, dialogues between humanitarian and palliative care organization communication and goals of care, symptom control, including those who are not, uh, who've got comorbid or, or pre-existing conditions, psychosocial and spiritual care, uh, end of life care, and of course, this whole issue around supporting one another as healthcare workers. Next slide. And I also want to thank the World Health Assembly for their very helpful statement on COVID-19 response and to all of the palliative care advocates who've been working hard to make sure that we see in this response a clear mention of pre-existing conditions and palliative care. And that's going to impact people like this wonderful lady, Adinka, uh, lady, an elderly lady, 
And what impressed me when I met her was that she was caring for her neighbor who had a very difficult head and neck cancer. But her neighbor was not somebody she knew. Her neighbor was the friend of a friend. The friend had already died. And she had now moved in to care for the friend of a friend who was equally elderly. People who are living in fragile circumstances, but teach us a lot about humanity. Next slide, please. When we look at where COVID-19 is mostly impacting in terms of direct infections, we can see uh, the picture that we know. It, it mirrors some of the travel, international travel pathways, but that situation is beginning to change. Hold this map in your mind for a moment. And now we go to the next slide and we see a map of fragile states. And what you'll see is that they're almost inverted at the moment. And, and that has given some more time for preparation. Maybe this also reflects testing and, and processes, but it also reflects that sometimes places like Uganda, where I'm just now, actually are more used to dealing with pandemics. But we do think of the impact that's going to happen as we now see uh, this virus spreading. We see Gaza, for example, uh, just in the last week, having recorded their first pandemic death a place which has a very high density of population and where they have been under 11 years of siege and lockdown. Uh, just reflect on that with your own experience of lockdown. Next slide, please. This is Vicky. Vicky is a palliative care uh, nurse leader. She's a wonderful, amazing, inspirational person. And her district hospital, which also serves 250,000 refugees in Northern Uganda, um, recently had their first uh, COVID-19 admission. And Vicky has, has really inspired a lot of the work we've been doing with her and her team in Northern Uganda, where they got on the back of motorbikes and went into the refugee settings to work closely with local colleagues. She's now the district lead for COVID-19 and also for humanitarian issues. And she talks about her motivation and it's deeply embedded in her sense of humanity, in her care for herself and one another in the team and for her sense of, of the spiritual meaning and purpose and God's calling in her life. Thank you. The patient has gone home and is very well, but went home to huge stigma, which is an important issue. Next slide. Now, the recommendations in this briefing note, and several of these will be taken up by Megan in her next session. And um, we want to think about how to integrate into existing health and social systems, as well as direct humanitarian responses. We want to develop guidelines and focus on some of these vulnerable groups. I'm delighted we're sharing this session with our, our friends who are going to talk about issues of, of differently abled and disability. We're also, it's important to, to look at these essential care packages. Megan's going to be talking more about that. And whether there's a role for palliative care uh, response teams alongside humanitarian um, uh, responses. And we've seen palliative care being embedded in some of the COVID-19 responses at the moment. And a lot we can learn from that. We need innovative practice. You see this picture is Palestine and Gaza where they're making masks where none are available. We need to think about the competencies that those of us working in humanitarian sectors need and we need to think of competencies that palliative care workers need to, need to have if they're going to be in humanitarian settings. How many people know how to, for example, properly apply PPE? And those are issues we need to remember. We need to remember empowering communities, particularly around psychosocial and spiritual support and training folk to do that um, and to learning from them as well as ethical research and the ethical evidence base. Next slide. Just to share some of those little snapshots of, of ethical work that has been done, uh, Dan Mundy and, and Mandy Grace and others in the team put together a very interesting study where they looked post earthquake and they interviewed people at home in very rural mountainous areas. And you know what? They found that if you were poor and in desperate situation before, you were still there afterwards. And that says a lot in terms of what we need to do to build um, safer and, and more humane environments and to have access to universal health care. Next slide, please. 
Our work in uh, northern Uganda, we've been looking at the needs in the refugee settings and you can see there we've used something called the APCA African Palliative Outcome Scale showing quite significant levels of need. These patients, these people were found by their, tr we trained the village health teams, the community health workers, and they themselves were empowered to help uh, find those who were in chronic disease and for us to look and see what the needs were. Um, and we're showing quite significant unmet need, including very little access to pain control. A lot of complex trauma along with the pain. This is a gentleman with a gunshot wound and 10 years of osteomyelitis. And also dis disability. This young boy has a learning uh, problem, but actually was very, very bright. But this wasn't really realized. And I was delighted that the village health team worker was also his teacher. And we're showing how without verbal skills, he was still able to score his palliative outcome scale. Next slide, please. So just in the last few uh, minutes, what is the way forward? I'm going to highlight a few areas from these recommendation. We need to be values based. Thank you to the bioethics group who produced such an excellent briefing note, Lisa and others, which reminds us that palliative care has something to say about those ethical decision makings, about making sure that we value the individual as well as look at it in the context of the resources and the health system, that we remember the moral distress that people may find themselves in. And there's so many testimonies of how that is impacted at this time. People who feel they're making wrong decisions and having then to live with that. And of course, our resilience, our coping, our spiritual resources. Thank you. Next slide. I also want to just say that we have to learn from models that are working. The Kerala floods and the Nipah virus, building on existing uh, integrated palliative care programs at the community, has led to a humanitarian working group across India that I have the privilege of being part of, and a state level in, uh, request to be involved now in the COVID-19 pandemic, including being part of the task force. And they have done a fab fabulous job. We have done uh, work together to produce a resource toolkit there's a link here to the ebook, to webinars, to online echo sessions, and at least 13 countries thus far have been involved, and we're hoping that that's going to be rolled out through the WHO office. Examples of how if you're already engaged, you're in the right position to then help when a pandemic comes. Thank you so much. Next slide. I love this uh, call from Antonio Gutierrez, the Gen Secretary General of the UN. Isn't this a great phrase? The fury of the, virus, of the virus illustrates the folly of war. This is a call to a global ceasefire. It's a reminder that we're only as strong as the weakest health system. We're only as safe as the most marginalized person. This is not about me keeping myself safe. This is about realizing those issues across our globe and war and conflict simply increase everyone's risk and of course are, are just hugely damaging to societies which are affected by that as we've already uh, alluded to in situations like Yemen. So this is a call for a global solidarity, for a global ceasefire. Next slide please. I think times like that bring out compassion and humanity. They may illustrate the other side of that, but let's focus on the positives. Rachel and I were fortunate to write this letter following a Lancet Palestine Health Alliance talking about how palliative care and suffering talks about dignity, uh, compassionate responses, easing suffering, common humanity, and how much we need to hear those messages. And in palliative care, we need to help our colleagues in doing this right now. We're seeing so many examples of acts of kindness and compassion, which is incredibly encouraging. Next slide. And finally, I, I want to quote from some youngsters in Gaza. These are medical students that I was, uh, had the privilege of teaching. I've been involved for six years and I asked them, what values do you see in palliative care? And they talked about it. All of these values, look at them, humility, justice, hope. These are youngsters who've been in lockdown under siege for 11 years and look at the hope they're sharing. One of them coined this phrase, humanity till infinity. That's how we describe palliative care. Isn't that fabulous? And Tolokot, if you do one more click, Stephen, you'll see Tolokot, he's a VHT in Northern Uganda. And I said, what message do you have to, to the wider world? And he said, I am human, by the way. Let's take this rallying call, humanity until infinity, as we move forward looking at these issues together. Next slide, please. 
Let's choose love instead of fear and hope and compassion. We have references to underline everything that we've been saying, um, but I'm delighted to hand back to Joan as we introduce our next speaker. There'll be time for discussions later on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Moira, for really an inspiring presentation and sharing your experiences. And I love that humanity until infinity. I think it's such a challenge for us. And so we're moving on to our second presenter who also has a great deal of experience in the field of humanitarian work. And that's Dr. Megan Doherty. She's based in Canada and Ottawa, and she's a specialist in pediatric palliative care. And she leads the Children's Palliative Care Initiative in Bangladesh and directs the pediatric palliative care program of the Two Worlds Cancer Collaboration in Hyderabad, India. Her international work focuses on developing palliative care in South Asia. And she has been doing a great deal of work with the Rohingya in Bangladesh with Dr. Fazana Khan. So Megan, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much and good morning or good afternoon, good evening to you all. I want to uh, acknowledge the entire group that is uh, working on these statements together. And you might see my children hanging out in the background. <laughs> Next slide, please. Next slide. So I want to um, build on what Moira said. And in, I think one key thing that we need to think about as we move forward and as we bring this to the forefront of the humanitarian discussion, because I think it's so vital, is to think about some of the barriers. And I'm not gonna talk about all of them today because I know Rachel will touch on these later, but there are a number of key barriers which uh, challenge our ability to integrate palliative care into humanitarian settings. Um, a few of them are listed here. I think pain medication at the bottom is a very, very major issue for many of our settings. And there's a lot of questions about cultural specific specificity. How do we integrate palliative care into all these different settings? What do we know? How do we bring it to uh, these groups? But then it's a, a key aspect is that collaboration, that working with the community, that developing the community from the ground up. And I'll speak a lot more to that as I give the example of the, our work with the Rohingya refugees. Next slide. I think that this is key. I think that we all um, want to save lives in a humanitarian setting and that's always been the focus, but that doesn't have to come at the expense of relieving suffering. These two are beautifully integrated into health systems and it's possible to integrate them into very basic health systems in settings where you don't have a lot of resources. And I'll share some of the resources we have that show us how to do that. Next slide. So I want to take the examples from our work in the Rohingya refugee crisis in Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh. And I want to acknowledge particularly Farzana Khan, who can't be with us today, who is key and is leading this work. Next slide. So we started with knowing what was the pre-COVID situation in this and other humanitarian situations. This was a report that we uh, released in early 2018, showing how much suffering there is in any humanitarian crisis. There's so much pain, there's no access to opioids, there's a huge challenge for people who are seriously ill, who are chronically ill, who are disabled or differently abled to access the basic care that they need. And then when you layer on the COVID pandemic now, nothing gets easier. It's exactly what uh, Moira has said. If you were poor before, you're still poor. You're still um, underrepresented. Your needs are usually not thought of. Next slide. But what we can do and what we know works in this type of setting based on our experiences is community-based programming that addresses these needs. And when I say community-based, it means we partner with the local community, which we've done in the Rohingya settlements. We actually um, train and empower volunteers or community health workers from that community, which we have done, to address the needs of the own, their own people within the population. And we support that with additional resources and funding that can, can allow this to happen. 
And this is an example of one of our little patients who um, has given me permission to share his story. He's four years old. He uh, came from uh, the area in Myanmar where the Rohingya were settled before to Bangladesh in 2018. And he has an untreated myelomeningocele, like a area on his spine where he has spina bifida. And he can't move his legs, he can't walk, he was carried the whole way. He had terrible wounds on his uh, back from lying on the ground a lot without any um, support. And we were able to identify him. Our community health workers were trained to care for him and to clean up those wounds. And he is back to a much better state of health as a result. Next slide. A few key features of our involvement in such a community is, I think one thing we often feel is that there's no one who will want to help in this community. These people might be very, very challenged as the Rohingya are in terms of access to any financial resources, having time to think about others outside of their own family. But in fact, there's always people who want to help others regardless of their situation, exactly like Moira's example of the Dinka lady who was caring for a friend of a neighbor. And this is what we do when we develop what we call a compassionate community within the refugee camp. We provide an outlet for this compassion that people have innately inside of them. They have a desire to help, and, but they don't always know how they can help these people who are very disabled. And so we develop with them a community ownership model where they are volunteers, where we involve the community leaders, and together we help build a project that is really owned by them. And, um, can be sustainable. And this can be applied, this was applied before the COVID pandemic, and these features still apply during the COVID pandemic. Yes, there are new challenges, all the things that Moira spoke about, but we can continue these types of initiatives and they're even more needed in a setting when there needs to be high levels of trust within your community to allow um, workers to go in, to allow the, the infection control measures you need for COVID-19 to be put into place in a community like the Rohingya refugees. Next slide. Our community health workers have a very basic training and they provide simple, basic care to those within their own community. Next slide. They don't need a lot of training. This is from the WHO manual on how to integrate uh, palliative care into um, most settings. These workers can have a short course and this can be applied in a COVID-19 situation. They just can help with basic tasks and you can cover these, these uh, training programs in three to six hours, and then you pair them up with somebody who's already doing the work um, so that they get a practical experience for it. Because they're very uh, basically trained and they don't necessarily have a background in healthcare, the on-the-job training or the on-site training helps them a lot to see what they're going to do. Next slide. And I think there's a lot of additional benefits that we didn't initially recognize from using community health workers. They help with health literacy, which is such a challenge in these populations. Um, they help patients find the right access to their services they need because patients often don't know where they need to go. They might show up at a primary health post, but they have much more of a secondary or tertiary problem. So it's much more efficient to get them straight to the, maybe the larger hospital within the camps. Our um, health workers accompany patients, and that model of accompaniment, again, is a form of partnership and compassion. And we help with making the recommendations from the hospital rather practical. For example, this little baby in the picture, he has um, club feet and he needs serial casting. So every week he's supposed to go get the cast changed. But the mother, when she gets told she has to go back every week to some faraway hospital, thinks like, what's wrong with these doctors? Why can't they fix him on the first try? Why do I have to keep going and going and going? And so our health workers help with understanding that piece. Next slide, please. In the, co in the camps, we have a challenges with the arrival of COVID-19. The population is incredibly dense. We have families of five to eight to 10 to 12 people living in a single room in a, a tent. Um, and when I say a tent, it's a structure made of just bamboo and tarpaulin because the Bangladesh government is not allowing any more permanent type structures, despite the length of time the people have been there. 
all the other challenges that Moira has spoken of, the pre-existing health conditions of the population. You know, this is a population that has not been vaccinated to any great extent in, in Myanmar. There's low health literacy, which I think really challenges people's ability to understand the recommendations for PPE, for infection control. And there's a lack of PPE and there's a lack of financial resources for refugees to have masks, to seek health care. And it's so challenging to reorganize your health services. Um, our palliative care workers that I've spoken about have now been redeployed to a, uh, um, a respiratory care center for patients with presumed COVID. So again, our palliative care services are being challenged even in this setting now that there's, the services are reorganized. And there's the challenges of providing virtual care where um, in many refugee situations like the Rohingya camps, there isn't a lot of access to cellular phones, there isn't access to um, data and ability to video chat. So we can't reach our patients in the same way that we can easily reach patients who are not in such fragile settings. Next slide. I want to highlight in the last couple minutes, the key things that we think are part of the solution. Education and training for humanitarian health workers. Uh, Pre-COVID, we were doing visiting palliative care teams to train our workers. Um, now we're trying to reorganize to a virtual setup. We need basic training materials that are suitable for the local context. And this is an example of a manual that we've developed. And then we need to recognize and we've done this in the statement uh, that we've released, some of the key roles that we can play as palliative care experts. There's a huge need for support for ethical decision making. Um, healthcare workers are always uncomfortable when they have to make decisions without a framework to, fall, to go to to make those decisions. It's very hard for individual healthcare workers or teams to make a decision about the level of care for a particular patient unless they have a framework and they can say, this is how we are deciding for everyone in this situation. And there's the idea of moral distress. And this is so challenging for all of our healthcare workers in humanitarian settings that this work uh, touches them profoundly and can be very, very challenging for them. Next slide. Moira's touched on these already, but I want to highlight the essential medicines and supplies which are listed in the the COVID uh, clinical management document, the orange uh, book that was released last week, including medications to manage key symptoms of COVID such as breathlessness and delirium. Next slide. And you can see from that orange document, there's an appendix which um, specifically mentions the medications that we, we do need, the absolute minimum we need to provide palliative care. Um, and the equipment that we need. Again, very basic equipment and then the human resources. And when uh, in the next page of the document, I haven't shown the key social supports in terms of how do we train people to provide psychosocial, emotional, spiritual support in these basic settings. Next slide. This is just showing how uh, for, the, for one of the first times, and I was very excited when I saw this document come out from the WHO, there is a chapter on palliative care, and then there's an appendix on these palliative care therapies, which is a wonderful step forward for us and a key uh, thing that will motivate the sector to incorporate these. Next slide. So I think we have many things to think about in our settings of um, where we provide palliative care for humanitarian emergencies. We had the first death from COVID of a Rohingya refugee, sadly, two days ago. And we, what will this hold for the future of those living in these very challenging settings? And what does palliative care look like in the setting of a COVID pandemic in humanitarian care and how do we deliver safe and effective care in this setting we're starting to understand but in the rohingya camps we're just starting to develop those documents because as i said our workers have been redeployed to um, severe acute respiratory infection units thank you very much thank you so much megan and i think the model that you're developing for the rohingya in cox's bazaar is something that we're going to be able to replicate and I, what I think is also very um, exciting for all of us is the WHO is saying that healthcare workers in COVID-19 should be trained not only in palliative care, but in the humanitarian health response as well. 
I'd just like to remind all of you, please, if you have any questions, put them into the chat box and we will be able to get our panel to answer them afterwards. So moving from the humanitarian crises to people with disabilities. And our presenter here is Dr. Anna-Marie Oberholzer from the University of South Africa, where she is presently a research fellow in the interdisciplinary field of spirituality and healthcare. She has her doctorate in nursing, focusing on empowering children in healthcare, where she worked with children with intellectual disabilities, including nonverbal children. Anna Marie is the coordinator of the Pediatric Empowerment Program and the chairperson of the Board of Hospice Vision. Thank you, Anna Marie. Thank you, Joan. Next, so we can start with the presentation. Thanks, Dina. I would like to first of all thank all my colleagues and the co-authors of the briefing notes. Um, they are Petra Berger, Marge Parr, John Marston, Mark Mishriga, and Ashna Rani. Um, and each one of them brought a very unique perspective and a very valuable experience to this group. Um, it, and also just so much information. I just want to say that we were not able to include all the information that this expert group brought um, in the such a condensed um, document of the briefing note. So, um, but hopefully this will start a bigger conversation on this really important topic. Also, during my presentation, um, I will also not be able to refer to everything in the briefing note. So I really want to encourage you to go and have a look at the briefing note um, and to read it for yourself. Um, the, the rest of the information as I would focus um, mainly on, on my work as well. Next slide. First of all, um, I would like us to have a look at the, how to define disability. Because disability is presented very uniquely in each individual. And we must be very careful not to generalize. Um, disabilities is a, is a very broad term. It's an umbrella term according to the World Health Organization, covering impairments, activity limitations, and also participation restrictions, which often is more about the barriers that society put up. Um, than the individual uh, disability of a person. If we have a look, for instance, only 5 to 15% of people who need wheelchairs have access to one, 10% uh, of access to hearing aids. So um, in this inequality is at the moment just intensified by the pandemic. Next slide. If I have a look at the statistics, um, of disabilities, one billion people worldwide are living with a disability. That is one out of seven. And if we look at people older than 60, it becomes even worse. It's almost half of, the, of people um, over the age of 60 years that have a disability. And 80% of these persons are in developing countries. Next. So, if um, we talk about people living with a disability in, during COVID-19. They all have it, uh, might have a high risk to contract COVID-19 because of physical difficulty to implement basic protective measures like hand washing, physical distancing, and also they might require the assistance from carers um, who might have to use public transport and do not practice social distancing. And also they might be living in institutions who could be overcrowded and unsanitary which increase their risk to contract COVID-19. And once they've contracted the, the um, virus, they also have an increased risk to become severely ill. They, according to the CDC, they are three times more likely to have another underlying illness than adults without disabilities. Next. During the, um, when we worked on, on the briefing note, what came out as, as very important amongst the group was communication issues. And I'm, um, again, the, only the, if we look at the communica communication with and from people with disabilities, it's already a huge topic on its own. So I just want to focus on a few important facts if we talk specifically of people with disabilities in healthcare. Um, the absence of carers and interpreters. Because of strict visiting policies, 
carers, primary caregivers are not often not able to be with the person with disabilities. They can't interpret, read body language, and explain what is the, the, the person wants to communicate. We also often use things like visual analog scales or faces pain scales for pain, which we can't use for people with visual impairment. They're also not always able to understand information, and for this I'm specifically referring to people with intellectual disabilities. Um, I'm sure everyone would agree that the late Professor Stephen Hawking, even though he had motor neuron disease, he were, was unable to communicate. He was definitely able to understand everything that would have happened to him in hospital if he had to be hospitalized. Even medical terms, he would have been able to understand. Um, often people generalize and think if someone has a physical disability that they, are, they have an intellectual disability as well, which is not the case. I just want to stress that fact. Then from the healthcare professional side, the use of face masks. Now I've seen everywhere on Facebook and social media posts of masks that's got a cut out area around the mouth um, that's substituted with a see-through plastic substance so that you can lip read. But this is unfortunately not possible for healthcare professionals um, with the surgical masks and the N95 masks. So, um, that's a big problem because people who must lip read can't read facial expressions, they can't read the lips of healthcare professionals. There's also often a lack of resources. Information is not available in Braille. There's no sign language interpreters or electronic devices, communication boards and pictures that, that people need to communicate with. And I want to refer you here to the website of the Center for Automated and Alternative Communication from the University of Pretoria as I do a lot of research and I've got information available to help people communicate with communication difficulties. And then also a lack of knowledge and understanding from healthcare professional side. They don't always know how to support and adequately care for people with disabilities in healthcare. And there's definitely um, a need for uh, more training in this regard. Next. So I'm just going to focus um, for the next few slides on next my presentation on the work that I'm doing in spiritual support and pain management. Now, um, if we talk about the holistic support of people, um, I've used this model in a number of articles that I wrote, and I like to compare it to empty vessels. We all have different needs. My bodily vessel um, won't look the same as the person next to me with a physical disability, or my vessel for the needs of the mind will not look the same as the next person with intellectual disabilities. But um, once we can, all our needs are met in all these areas, in the area of the body, the mind, and the spirit, our vessels can be filled up, they can be filled up to the brim. And these vessels are standing on the corners of a triangle. And if all our vessels are full, we are in harmony, we are in balance. And if all our needs are met, even people with, with um, disabilities can, can flourish and can, can be in, in, in harmony. Next slide. There are so many different interpretations of spirituality, um, but I also would like to um, look at, if you, if you look at the definition of all the different, there's a lot of different definitions for spirituality, but they all come down to specific spiritual needs. And uh, the spiritual needs identified is you have the need to be in a relationship with someone or something bigger than yourself, a relationship with God or with nature. Transcendence, um, to have the need to experience something beyond the physical. And especially children are very um, tuned into transcendence and easily stand in awe and wonder of the environment. Meaning and purpose, we all want to live a life with meaning and filled with meaning and purpose. And also we have the need to experience harmony and virtue, to be able to do good and to make a contribution to the environment next, and a contribution to the people around us. So spiritual support is vital to cope during difficult times and people with disabilities can experience liberation and inclusion in faith communities when the church accepts them for who they are and not focusing on their disability. However, they are often excluded from or feel unwelcome in faith communities. And this is according to a research that monitored 
they, uh, disability are often seen as the result of a sin or even bad karma or a curse of the ancestors. Disability is something that should be healed. People often find that they can't just go to church and worship with other people because everyone wants to pray for them for healing for, from their disability. And facilities are inaccessible. There are stairs and not enough ramps. Um, toilet facilities are inaccessible to wheelchairs. So while some found peace, others are wounded by the negative effects. Um, next slide. So we must be vigilant that people coming into hospital might experience spiritual pain and anguish. We assume that people, if they want to be part of a religious community, they can be, but that's not always the case with people with disabilities. Now, this brings us to the next topic and the next part of, of the work that I do is with regards to pain. And although there's not a lot of research done on spiritual pain, there's a lot of research and fascinating research, research coming forth on the link between physical pain and emotional and social pain. Next. So the research, is, this is just an example of one research, research study that's been done um, using a functional MRI to show that when people experience social rejection pain and physical pain, it is processed in exactly the same areas in the brain. So we all know, we know for a couple, many years now that social support also help with physical pain, but now we're starting to see the physical evidence when using um, functional MRI for these studies. Next. So for the last few minutes, I just want to um, focus on a few um, of, of awareness, where we need awareness and training of healthcare professionals um, in these areas. And one is, is the first is the children with autism spectrum disorder. There is a misconception that because these children sometimes exhibit self-injurious behavior. For instance, they would bang their heads or bite themselves. And because of that, they are not able to feel pain. But that is absolutely not true. It's very difficult for people with autism spectrum disorders to integrate and interpret sensory and emotional experiences. And it makes it very challenging for them to differentiate between anxiety and pain. Now, we all know hospital environment is just creating so much more. It's creating anxiety for any child, but especially for someone with autism spectrum disorder as the bright lights and the loud noises, they just can't handle that. So the increased anxiety just lead to increased pain and it's difficult for them to report self, to self-report pain. And also the facial expressions and body language are very individualized of these people and they don't match often unmatched the pain scores and descriptors, which lead to different interpretation of pain and underreporting of pain. Next. The next I would like to refer to is people, children, adults with neurological disabilities, and um, they can also communicate their pain in a huge variety of ways. What we must look for is vocal sounds, eating habits, changing eating habits and sleeping habits, changing social interaction, facial expressions, um, increased or decreased activity levels, the body and limbs, subtle changes, using one limb a little bit less than the other or what the previous been doing. And then also physiological and shivering, sweating, breath holding. Now these topics are all um, uh, this, um, used to, to, to develop, have used it to develop a lot of uh, um, things that you must look for. And they've got, for instance, a non-communicating children's pain checklist, which is the, the original scale consisted of, of, I think, 27 items. The revised one has got 30 items of a checklist that you must stick on behaviors that, that these people can exhibit. And even that is not fall short. And, and we often find that children are, exhibit behaviors that's not on the checklist. So on the next slide, um, both uh, researchers have developed the individualized numeric rating scale. I just want to know because I think this is really a wonderful scale to use, where they make use of the primary caregivers and of parents to fill in the scale. And the parent can say, well, if my child is not experiencing pain, um, then they 
are playful and smiling. If they start to experience a little bit of pain, and this is just an example, they start to get fidgety. And if they have a lot of pain, they become inconsolable and stiff. So parents can fill in the scale and healthcare professionals can use the scale if the parents are not there. Um, but it's very important that to know that the pe people can, they do communicate, people with neurologic disabilities do communicate their pain. It's our responsibility to become aware of how they communicate pain and to look for it. Next slide. I just want to summarize what I've been said so far. Um, I absolutely believe that contact between the person with disabilities and primary carers are very important and if they can't be there at the hospital physically it's very important to keep communication through electronic media if possible input from the primary carers are vital we need to ensure adequate communication resources where possible and most important even though a person cannot speak it does not imply that they cannot communicate thank you very much Thank you so much, Anna Marie, for that presentation. And I was listening to it and thinking of how much I still have to learn in actually learning to communicate with so many people. I think that one of the, the um, quotes that you said there was people with disabilities can flourish. And so our final speaker, I'm going to introduce in the words of Dr. Raj Gopal, who knows her so well, and that is Ashla Rani who's been living with quadriplegia for the past 10 years. Six years back, she came to Pallium, India as a palliative care recipient, soon became the chairman's executive assistant and a palliative care advocate. Recently, she became a trustee of Pallium, India, contributing to planning and execution of its activities. She also functions as a counselor for children and as a coordinator for Pallium, India's rehabilitation program for people with major disabilities. Ashra was awarded Kerala Government's Youth Icon Award in 2017. And about her life, she says, it is true that if given a choice, I would like to walk again. Nevertheless, it's equally true that my life on a wheelchair during the last six years has been more meaningful than that of all the 28 years in which I walked. So for someone who as disabilities and who has shown us how to flourish, I'm going to hand over to Ashla for her reflections on living with a disability in the time of COVID. Thank you, John. Um, thank you, Annie Marie, for uh, that wonderful presentation. And uh, so, yeah, I live with quadriplegia and I use a wheelchair for mobility. But I'm disabled not because uh, I use a wheelchair for mobility, but because uh, the world outside is not accessible for wheelchair. So, but then now I live in a place where uh, uh, I have ac pretty much uh, good accessibility and people around me are uh, treating me as an equal uh, counterpart. But this is not a situation for many others in the country. Life with disability is not an easy life to live, to say the least. So I live in Trivandrum, which is the capital city of uh, the tiny state of Kerala in India. And after having its uh, first few cases of COVID-19, uh, Kerala announced uh, lockdown and then uh, followed by and the next day the country the whole country announced lockdown so his life uh, became difficult for everyone uh, during this covid lockdown and nobody knew how to handle this new situation but then uh, how did that affect people with disabilities in the country whose life already was uh, in lockdown in a country like India. So we got, during those uh, first few weeks of uh, lockdown, we got so many distress calls uh, across the country uh, saying that, okay, blood transfusions for uh, hematological conditions like thalassemia was not happening. And then that was aggravating the situation. 
and then mental disabilities like schizophrenia, people with schizophrenia was, were not getting medicines because that was considered essential medicines. And I heard, like equally relevant, I heard from one of my uh, colleague and friend uh, who was a, a transgender that she wasn't getting uh, her hormone medicines because that was essential. And uh, we heard that okay, physiotherapy was no more available for people at homes, and then that aggravated situations for people with multiple sclerosis. And then uh, caregivers were uh, uh, not, they couldn't reach their homes, and then those who were uh, depending solely on caregivers for their daily activities, those who were having uh, physical dependence on caregivers were no longer getting those services. And uh, physical distancing was uh, impossible for them. And then those who were reaching, uh, were able to reach home, those caregivers, it's, uh, they were not able to uh, give them adequate and uh, protected care because, uh, because of their social interactions outside uh, these people on uh, quarantine. And then uh, governments were giving uh, though meager, the governments were trying to give some pensions, but then, uh, interestingly, that people were people with disabilities without any public transportation available. They were depending on family members or friends to get that money, and then they were actually abused financially, and then they weren't given those amounts. And and then they were in some cases they were uh, denied food when there was a scarcity of food because they had to depend on somebody else to feed them and they were not fed. So those were in the easy situations to be part of a recipient. And then it, it, it took us a lot of, uh, I don't know, I felt really uh, sad those moments and help, helpless those moments wherein we couldn't do much for people across the country, only for people who were, we were directly uh, like servicing in Chivantram, we could uh, get them food kits across and then get them enough support, ensure that enough supports are available to them. But then for people uh, outside our uh, like area of service, we couldn't do much than asking somebody else to can you please help and try to get those help across. So it wasn't an easy situation for us to understand and live. And when it comes to, I, I completely agree with uh, Dr. Annie Marie when he's, she said that, okay, people with disabilities, they need a uh, purpose uh, uh, to live. And then given that, uh, that situations and abilities, uh, and then by looking at their uh, abilities instead of disabilities, they can flourish. So I, I look at myself as a, proof of that, but unfortunately, I'm, I'm one among the very few uh, privileged people in the country who has that access to proper rehabilitation and access to a, a place where I can live and work. Many of my uh, people, uh, counterparts who are living with a severe disability do not have that. They do not get a proper rehabilitation. They do not get uh, an opportunity to live a life with dignity wherein they can uh, work and they, they can earn for themselves and they can support the families. So, so what we can do in this situation, what palliative care can do, palliative, palliative care for disabled or people with disabilities doesn't come at all under the palliative care uh, WHO definition but because that defines people with life-threatening conditions, and then uh, people with physical disabilities. So conditions of people with disabilities, with physical disabilities are not life-threatened in the developed world. But what happens in the developing countries, in low- and middle-income countries, where 80% of the globe lives? We do not have any uh, proper rehabilitation centers. We, we do not get a especially people in the rural areas, they do not know how to manage this situation and they end up living their life inside the four walls of their house, one single room. 
So that threatens life if we define life as something with a meaningful, something which we, where a person should have some minimum dignity that he is living and then uh, he is, is not existing physically. So if, if we can include uh, people with disabilities into uh, the care, under palliative care, so we can get them all palliative care and proper rehabilitation under these. We have uh, shown that, that it is possible in Kerala. In our tiny state of Kerala, we do have uh, so many palliative care centers and all are in, uh, including people with disabilities, especially physical disabilities under their care for you. And then they are given proper rehabilitation and they are given an opportunity for uh, work like vocational rehabilitation is one of the main areas where we focus and then because of that there are so many people who are able to work even after uh, having a spinal cord injury it's something uh, which they can do from a wheelchair there are many things which they can do and though meager they are earning a living and then they are so happy and uh, living uh, a life with dignity and even supporting their family so when we did one uh, study in Pallium India, where and how, uh, how our vocational rehabilitation programs were helping our uh, uh, patients, and the one thing uh, stood out when they said that many of them uh, said that, okay, it is uh, not just the money which I get out of it, but that when I get up in the morning, there is, there is something which is there for me to do, and that, that's making me get up in the morning. And one of the uh, patients said that I'm able to sleep well uh, on those days where I work so hard. So like in, how many of us complain that okay, it was so hard work and I'm not able to, uh, I, I'm not getting some time to sleep and we wait for uh, Fridays or weekends to rest. And there are so many people in this country in this world wherein they are, they are simply whiling away this time watching TV or simply uh, looking at their attic, uh, not, not knowing what to do and when the death will come. So that is the situation of people with disabilities in 80% of uh, the globe. And uh, if, if we can include palliative care uh, into, if palliative care can include people with disabilities into their care spectrum, we are going to change life for them so and even when uh, during this COVID okay you get COVID-19 uh, and then if as the Fran Mary said uh, if you, you know so many of them are living with uh, secondary conditions and then uh, uh, home mobility so that if you catch uh, COVID-19 I'm sure that if I get COVID-19 all with my uh, is uh, lung capacity, I, I may not or I will not uh, survive. So what about my advanced directives? What do I want uh, during my end of life care? Are people with disabilities getting a chance to even discuss that? Or how they want to be cared? They are not being cared for the first place that's there. And then with all this triage and this thing, I'm not sure how people, they'll be cared for. But then they are not even given an opportunity to talk about what is uh, happening for them and what, what they need. People are not uh, having time to ask them or understand what they need during their end of life. So these are all uh, realities. And then today what I hope is that, okay, uh, like be in COVID or after COVID, we are, if we are going to include people with disabilities into palliative care, there will be many, many, many people who are going to benefit it out of that. And then I really hope that I'll be able to see that in my lifetime that, okay, this uh, the palliative care is given to all these people and then all possible that even when Moira was uh, talking uh, and Megan was talking, that it is not very difficult. With, with minimum resources, we'll be able to achieve uh, so much. So. I, I really, really hope that we will be able to do that and then we see that people with uh, all these conditions living a life with dignity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ashla. You always are such an eloquent advocate. 
And you actually have given us a big challenge because if we want to reach the billion people who have disabilities, palliative care has got a long way to go. And I also love that you, that you say that it's not your disability, it's that the world is not accessible. And that really links to what Anna Marie said about it's our responsibility to make the world accessible for people with disabilities. And so in this, I would also like to um, say a big thank you to Petra Berger and to Marge Farr, who both living with disabilities contributed so much to the briefing note. And this briefing note on um, disability and palliative care and COVID-19 really is full of the voice of people with disabilities. And so thank you so much to all the panelists for such excellent presentations. We've learned so much and we've been challenged so much. And so we're going to go on to our question and answers. And I'd like to introduce the extra panelist we have, and that's Rachel Coughlin, who's in Australia. She trained as a physiotherapist and a public health specialist and has more than 15 years experience working with international humanitarianism. At present, she's doing a PhD at Deakin University, looking at the role of palliative care in humanitarian emergencies and crises, with focus on countries experiencing armed conflict. And Rachel has written some wonderful um, blogs and articles on her learning and her experience. And so Kate and Shelley, could I hand over to you, please? Thank you very much, Joan, and thank you everyone um, for your presentations and to Ashla for that uh, really insightful reflection. Um, the first question is for Rachel, um, and it asks, can you comment on why palliative care has not yet been successfully integrated into most responses to humanitarian emergencies, and does COVID-19 present an opportunity for more integration? Great, thanks Shelley, thanks Joan, um, and thanks to all the um, presenters for such an engaging discussion so far. Um, I think some of, some of the answers to this question have been touched on um, by Megan and Moira, and Moira um, but I'll try and summarise it, I think, and perhaps add a few of my own ideas um, as to where we might go to next with this, this massive topic. Um, so I think we can summarise the challenges around four key areas from the small amounts of research that are already out there. So firstly, palliative care is not currently part of the everyday practice of modern humanitarian agencies. Um, modern humanitarian agencies tend to have a bias towards curative medicine and a focus on saving lives, as Megan touched on, I think. The second major challenge um, is that resource limitations are, are a large barrier. How do you successfully argue for the provision of pain management for a dying person when even the basics of survival, such as food and water, may be hard to come by? And these challenges of prioritisation are tremendously real and tremendously painful in a context where resources are very limited. Third, as we've met, heard mentioned, there are a lack of policies, guidelines and training to support humanitarian agencies to integrate palliative care into their work. And the final big challenge is that the diversity and cultural values of illness, death and dying are a challenge for the implementation of palliative care, which has been developed predominantly within a Western frame. And as we've heard, the palliative care sector um, has started to take leadership and has paid increasing attention, um, particularly in recent years, to humanitarian emergencies, and especially on the issue, I think, of, of guidelines, education and training. But despite this, and as we've seen very recently, even COVID-19 response plans um, that have been put out by humanitarian agencies continue to omit palliative care. Um, humanitarian agencies are not yet taking the leadership um, on palliative care that, that really needs to happen. I'd actually be really interested um, in, in doing a quick survey of the participants on this webinar. Um, I'm interested in how many of our audience today would say that they're they primarily belong to the humanitarian sector or are with a humanitarian agency. Um, and perhaps if you are, um, you could send us a message in the chat, bot, chat, chat box. It'd be, it'd be great to hear from you. I think currently the vision that we're offering palliative care um, is that we're offering of palliative care is falling short. Um, so if I can just take a, a couple more minutes, Joan, um, and, and share my um, ideas on 
on what I think needs to happen. And I think there are three big ideas um, that we need to be considering. Firstly, I think we need to start an honest and open ethical debate. In our quest to bring the best clinical palliative care to every individual suffering person, we can sometimes tend to miss the crucial moral dilemmas of how to prioritise limited resources, who we should be prioritising, how we should support, be supporting healthcare workers who might be experiencing moral distress in caring for dying patients. And we need to be bold to open this debate in order to overcome such dilemmas. We also need a greater humility to acknowledge that there will still always be suffering in humanitarian contexts that we cannot mend. And I've co-authored a paper with two wonderful colleagues, Kiona Wynn and Mila Petrova, exploring some of these moral dilemmas, um, which is due out hopefully very soon in the Journal of Medical Ethics. The second big idea is that I think that humanitarian agencies and actors at all levels need to remember the fundamental principle of humanity that they've signed up to, and it's aimed to not just save lives, but also to alleviate suffering. Sometimes humanitarian agencies can bring a certain ego and a save the world mentality to humanitarian response. And we need to encourage them to tap into the softer approaches of witnessing, of sitting and caring. We need to think about how small but potent compassionate acts of palliative care that can be enacted no matter how scarce the resources um, and in doing so remind us of the very roots of humanitarian action. And the third big idea is that we need to think about who the real humanitarians are and ensure that they're central to our efforts to integrate palliative care. And by that I mean the vernacular world of neighbours, relatives and strangers who play a central role in responding to any crisis. Most humanitarians are volunteers and many communities already enduring humanitarian crisis can actually teach us much about voluntary caring. We have to harness the power of communities and volunteer networks to provide comfort and presence to those who are suffering. While local humanitarians may not be familiar with formal palliative care, even when there is no existing formal palliative care, we need to look for what already exists in the community and seek to build on it. And we also have to do away with colonial attitudes and ensure that we're tapping into cultural values of death and dying. So those are my three big ideas. Firstly, having an honest and rich ethical debate. Secondly, remembering the principle of humanity and the power of small compassionate acts. And lastly, harnessing the power of local volunteers and communities. Um, and finally, on the question of the opportunity of COVID-19, I think that COVID-19 certainly does present um, an immediate opportunity in that it's a time that we can bear witness and we can start to capture um, community stories for future efforts. But we also do need a vision for palliative care that is both ambitious but is also honest and humble. Um, and I think in the very first instance meets communities where they're currently at. Um, and I think that's our, that's our big duty as a, as a palliative care sector. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rachel, for so eloquently actually expressing what the challenges are. Thanks very much, Rachel. Thank you, Joan. Um, the next question is um, for Megan. Um, you discussed the dichotomy of saving lives and relieving suffering um, and how to um, you know, bring these two together. Um, can you advise delegates on how to make the case to relieve suffering to donor agencies who are focused only on saving lives? That's a hard question. <laughs> um, I don't want to pretend that we've had a ton of success. We have now have funding for our project in the Rohingya camps. And we just spent a lot of time chipping away at uh, the WHO and our partners in uh, Cox's Bazaar and just repeating our points about palliative care, that palliative care is essential, it relieves suffering, it's you know, that it, it has been declared like an, a key part of universal health care, um, that it's cost effective, that it, you know, really touches on vulnerable and marginalized groups, like just kind of those generic type points. And we just didn't ever stop. And I think sometimes you just can wear people down. 
this is this is a strategy I use sometimes. Um, you just keep going, and they're like, okay, forget it. They're just never going to go away. Let's give them some money. So I think that might have been what worked. Um, but we also somehow managed to do a little pilot ourselves, where we actually created a tiny model of what we thought we could do, and and did it. And we just had two palliative care workers in the beginning, just two of them, like two Rohingya gentlemen who we trained up, who would go and see patients, and they couldn't see many patients. There's 800,000 people in these camps, and they, you know they could see 80 people maybe, but we showed that it was possible. Um, and we showed that it really made a difference for those people. We told stories of children like the little boy with the myelomeningocele and how um, we really made a difference for one child or for one individual and how they, they had a huge impact on their quality of life with very simple things that could be done. And I think maybe that helped as well. Um, all of the documents that you see like the, the guidelines on how to integrate palliative care into humanitarian crises, the WHO COVID-19 response documents, these really help because you can pull it out and say, look, you said this has to be part of the response, so how are you gonna do that? And you can say, we can do that with you, and here's how we think we can do it. Now, I think one thing that has helped us a lot too is because it's quite challenging work, palliative care is not, easy it's not like vaccinating babies and you know just prescribing antibiotics let's not fool ourselves it's actually more tricky and it's it's um so i think another part of our success was dr farzana khan who's a palliative care expert and other palliative care experts myself and others who were there physically and could guide the work um and having someone who is a really a palliative care specialist as much as we don't want to over specialize everything that's done in these settings was helpful because she had that level of, of confidence and leadership and she could say, when someone came and said, well, this isn't really a palliative care patient, how dare you incorporate them into your program? Like a child with club feet, technically not a palliative care patient, right? Like not a life-threatening or life-limiting condition. But she could say, no, this child is suffering. This child has a huge, serious health-related suffering because there's no access to services. And then she said, so we're gonna take that up. And that confidence that comes from being uh, someone who knows a lot about palliative care, I think was invaluable in our initial uh, piloting efforts. Uh, but I don't have a secret sauce that will make people listen to you um, other than passionate, continued efforts. Thank you very much, Megan. That's a very, um, you know, honest, um, but also really helpful answer. Um, the next Shelley, question. Uh, oh, sorry, Shelley. I wonder if I could jump. Am I allowed to jump in and answer as a panel? Yes, absolutely. Oh. Yes, yes. <laughs> Just briefly, because um, uh, I think one of the things that um, that Megan and Fazana you have done, um, and I think um, needs to be done in many other contexts, is actually demonstrating the need for palliative care. Um, on a recent trip um, to Gaza for my own research, I had a, a very senior. Uh, WHO leader um, within the Gazan team um, say to me, yes, of course, I understand that palliative care is important and I understand what it means, but you need to come to me and show me what the need is in order for me to be able to convince donor governments, um, to convince the rest of our, you know, the humanitarian agency network in Gaza, um, that there is actually, you know, a, a hard need um, for palliative care. And I think um, that the next part of, uh, of, of demonstrating that need um, is, is to bring the community voice into that. Um, so to be able to say, this is, this is what our community here says and thinks about palliative care. This is what our community understands by palliative care, um, even if they don't call it that. Um, and, and these are the things that our community is saying are most important for them um, in, in suffering and illness and, and in dying um, and in death. Um, just another a quick anecdote. I had a, um, a lady uh, who I, wrote, I recently wrote about in a blog um, in Gaza who has endured immense suffering um, and, uh, you know, including the death of her sister from breast cancer, the death of her seven-year-old daughter from a congenital condition. Um, and then her own breast cancer diagnosis. And when I asked her what would have helped you most through all of those um, traumatic events, 
she said, the one thing um, that I can think of that would have helped me most was if somebody had have smiled at me when I entered, when I repeatedly entered the chemotherapy room. That's the thing that would have helped me the most. So I think we can't, um, we can't always presume what communities want without asking them first and, and taking that information to donor governments um, and donor agencies to say, these are the things that are most important for this particular community. Thanks very much, Rachel. Um, the next question is for Ashla. Um, you spoke about um, the issue of advanced directives. Um, do you have any advice on how uh, to open the conversation about advanced directives with people who are at higher risk um, for COVID-19? Thank you. It's also a difficult question. When we are, uh, when everybody are talking about uh, like courage, uh, battle, victory, and all those positive words, and nobody wants to hear anything about uh, like death. And then they see it as giving up. So it, it's not an easy thing to do. And it, it's all the more difficult during a crisis like this because it is seen as, uh, as, as uh, pessimism or giving up. I did try to write to uh, write some articles about it, but then when I wrote about um, uh, about what needs to be uh, what extra care people with disabilities should uh, take during COVID-19 and all, everybody, every editors uh, crossed these uh, sentences on advanced directives. I never got into publishing that or asking somebody to. Uh, think about it. So it's, it's not an easy uh, thing to do, especially during a crisis, but I think it's something which we should slowly start and death is, death is a stranger in our uh, society at now. So we should, we should familiarize with death and we should start talking slowly and slowly. It's not an easy process to do and it is, it is not something which we can uh, achieve immediately not just for uh, people with disabilities or people who are uh, uh, more prone to these diseases, but even for uh, the normal community. So I'm so sorry that I don't have an answer. Thank you, that's a very helpful response. Um, the another question is, um, what advice would, uh, it's for all panelists, uh, what advice would you give palliative care managers in lobbying for COVID-19 testing in crowded um, areas, um, refugee and internally displaced person settings, um, and particularly in politically tense situations? Is this a possibility? Moira, would you like to handle that one? Sure, I think it's a challenge, isn't it? It's a challenge for high income countries with loads of resources. So it's going to be a challenge. I have been impressed uh, talking specifically about Gaza and South Sudan and um, how it, it's been integrated within the programs. Now, that doesn't mean it's working perfectly. Vicky's here on the, on, on the call, I can see. And when they had a case in Adjumani, um, that was it was done with quite a lot of care to make sure that there was access and advice given. They're using things like radio programs and, and um, other ways in which people can access information other than internet or smartphones. Um, I think the conflict element just adds a, a degree of lack of safety, even for healthcare workers, which makes it really, really tough. And in those circumstances, we're not the experts in palliative care. Our colleagues who are in the, the health system or in the humanitarian sector will be much more used to managing the safety aspects. What we can do is try and encourage a holistic approach within what is often a process testing environment. And the angle that we found it most successful to argue that for is through the psychosocial domain. Now, of course, there's other issues, but that has been very widely recognized as an area which we can contribute. And then once you're inside those meetings and those systems, you're able to influence other parts of what's happening. Thank you, Moira. And does anyone else have anything to add to that one? Thanks. Um, 
Then uh, we just wanted to ask, how have uh, palliative care workers um, handled end-of-life care for patients with Ebola and now COVID-19? And are there any essential best practices uh, that can be shared from these two situations? We're I just again. spoke, so I just wanted to speak again, but can I, can I mention just one story? It was a very moving story that was shared in the Indian networks when we were discussing this. And it was actually of somebody, and, and I'm sorry if it's, it's, it's it, it, it was somebody saying, I wish I had taken more concern over my PPE. So it was somebody who was saying, we kind of tended to dash in and do stuff. And then we realized that if, if we got sick and if we died, actually the next person got a worse level of care. So one of the clear messages was be really careful to care for your healthcare workers and for the, the moral distress issues for your healthcare workers. While of course we, we focus also on those who are infected and affected by COVID-19. Um, I'll jump in next then. I think uh, we certainly learned a lot of lessons from Ebola um, around how to care for people with an infectious disease when you are so limited in the amount of um, human contact um, that you can provide for somebody who is seriously ill or dying. Um, um, you know, so in, in a situation where you can't have a family member necessarily sitting by and holding their hand or stroking their cheek, or giving them essential accompanying in dying. Um, so, you know, a lot of the, I think a lot of the innov innovative ways even that we are seeing now in rich country contexts of, um, a, you know, trying to accompany a person dying of COVID, um, we learnt a lot of those from the Ebola crisis. Um, you know, innovative things like holding a phone up, up to somebody. Um, and now we're seeing a lot of, you know, FaceTime screens and we're seeing, um, health workers putting their, uh, you know, a, sm a smiling photo of themselves on their gown when their face is being concealed by the PPE. Um, so yeah, I think certainly Ebola taught us a lot in that. We didn't necessarily um, always get it right in the Ebola situation, but a lot of those innovative things did come from, from that situation. Thank you, Kate. I think we're coming to the end of this session. It's been a wonderful session. And first of all, we'd like to invite you to next week's webinar, which will be on Thursday, the 11th of June at the same time. And the topic will be something that's been touched on a few times today, interprofessional spiritual care, and then on self-care. And for spiritual care, we have a really distinguished panel joining us. We have Dr. Christina Puhalski, from the George Washington Institute for Spirituality and Healthcare, Father Rick Bauer from the Mary Noel Fathers, who's been working in Africa for the past 15 years, and Dr. Melvin uh, Delgado, who has been working um, within the GWISH group. Um, Stephen, would you like to say something about the self-care panel? Yeah, I think self-care is gonna be a really important topic for our series, and we're fortunate to have uh, two really excellent faculty, Professor, uh, Mary Vachon, who originally wrote the original book on occupational stress and the care of the critically ill, the dying, and the bereaved, and Professor Dale Larson from Santa Clara University, who um, has just updated his book, The Helper's Journey, Empathy, Compassion, and the Challenge of Caring. So look forward to that uh, next time. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you for all the backroom work that you do to make these webinars successful. And so I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us today. Um, I've seen a lot of the chats and a number of resources have been accessed. And so the message is going out there even further. We've got many more webinars pl planned in the coming weeks. So I do hope you'll join us. And I'd like to really say a huge thank you to our faculty today, to Moira, to Megan, to Anna Marie and Ashla and to Rachel, and to everyone who has given input into these briefing notes, because these really have been a labor of love, I think, having worked with both panels. And they do in, um, enclose a lot of lived experience, both from the humanitarian and from the disability group as well. So thank you everyone for all that you have given to these webinars. And so on behalf of the four global um, palliative care organizations, I'd like once again to say thank you. 
I hope you are well and I hope you keep well. Um, bye for now.